Now it's time for our first um, of three panel discussions. It is called Digitalization of Construction Education, Challenges and Solutions. And for the sake of time saving, the participants were asked to send the questions before the event. So during the discussion, only the moderators, me and Yanis, uh, will be asking the questions. And now please welcome Dr. Noah Salib, Associate Professor of London Middlesex University in Creative Technologies and Construction. The university developed one of the first beam management master's programs in the world. Mr. Rodrigo Ferreira, manager at Ziggurat Global Institute of Technology. Ziggurat offers several beam management programs and operates in several world regions. And also we have Latvian panelists. Artus Neibux, representative of the and beam course developer at the University of Love Sciences and Technologies, and Carlos Kostukovs, assistant professor and head of Department of Civil Building Construction at Riga Technical University. Welcome. How are you doing today? Hello. Good morning. I'm doing very Hello. good. Very thank good. You. Thank you. Th this actually was a sound test. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I have a following proposal. Uh, we have a set of questions for you today, and I will be asking them in turn, and for each question I will propose one person to start, and then we will try to you know, develop discussion in that way. So I will ask if somebody wants to elaborate more, uh, something like that. So let's begin. Uh, Dr. Noah, maybe you will start. Please, could you describe the organization of your distance learning process, how it is organized and uh, how it looks like? Thank you, Igor. Um, I mean, when we talk about organizing distance learning, um, I know that I come from an academic background, but I guess it's the same thought process when you think about any training project or any training process. Well, the first thing that you have to do is just assess the gap. Uh, we work closely with industry, so we have to continuously, yearly, and even sometimes um, um, biannually, uh, sorry, um, uh, semi-annually, uh, see what is needed out there. Um, what are the gaps in roles and responsibilities? And the second thing is assess new updates. The constant um, innovations in, 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 uh, in technologies, in standards, in protocols, in processes. So this has to be done uh, when you first organize any distance learning process. It's the same, of course, with face-to-face, -face, so it's not different in that respect. But regarding our particular aims and objectives when we come to organize, we have to achieve three main things. First of all, to simulate as much as possible something that is very similar to a face-to-face -face experience for our participants. We call them students, but they're actually not students. They're, they're all people in industry, mostly. Uh, secondly, as well, to simulate as much as possible a real-life work environment, a real-life work experience through the projects, through the um, um, coursework that they do. And thirdly, and most importantly for us when we come to organize how the distance learning is going to do is going to be done, is how to initiate critical analysis within the people who are studying. Um, it is above all, maybe that's the most important one. It's not, it's never ever about just the what is being done and how it's being done. It is always about the why things are being done. And this is probably injected in everything that we produce while we are organizing how the distance learning process is being done. I know that maybe there will be questions later or will be asked about uh, the, the technicalities of doing it and tools and stuff, but I don't wanna focus on that right now. The organization is always about the strategic plan that you're gonna put in place when you're going to deliver. So that's just my little piece for now. Thank you very much. And uh, maybe Rodrigo, you would like to elaborate more and share your vision, your uh, approach uh, to the distance learning. Yeah, yeah. Um, first of all, and thank you very much for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to be in this panel discussion with so honorable people. And here at Zigurat, actually we have um, 20 years of experience in this distance learning. And actually we have, um, the same philosophy, there is a line actually what Dr. Noah just mentioned. We have a, a philosophy here that we try to unite 
and what the industry demands, and then what the academia has to teach, and then the association of professionals. This is our philosophy when we try to organize our and educational and distance learning. And then we have, um, here we follow as well in, in the education field, there is a model that is very known um, that says that the, the professionals, they learn in a model that is the, the 70, 20, 10. 70 is related with job experience, okay? If you teach for these professionals, and subjects related with job experience, and they are going to and have a, a better learning experience. Then there is a 20% related with um, interaction with others, and 10% is related with educational events. And here at Zigurat, what we try to do it is to unite this 100%, so our participants, it's our students, like Dr. Noah just mentioned, but they actually they are professionals, get this overall experience in their learning process. So in this distance learning, actually what we try to do it is to give them job um, related experience. We promote as well a collaborative methodology and so they can interact with each other. And then of course we have classes that is the 10% of the, of the event, the, the, the tutors and the coordinations. So basically, and this is how we organize and our distance learning. From what I, from what I heard, uh, the emphasis uh, quite often is put on the uh, practical application of the knowledge and sharing of the experience in the industry. Right, so maybe Arthur, you would like to continue and share your thoughts on the topic. We can't hear you. Please check your microphone. Can you hear? Yeah, hello, good morning. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> um, well, I can agree to previous opinions. Uh, we do the pretty similar way. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, quite uh, important to, to teach students the workflows, the processes because the technologies are changing over the times and uh, that's what I'm doing in my courses. Um, I'm uh, putting uh, different technologies. Uh, I'm changing also the process so, so students can adapt and learn how to uh, establish those processes, how to step in, uh, how to develop, develop their own processes. And of course, there's this, um, this um, combination of uh, technologies of people, of uh, students that are uh, learning and uh, the processes. And uh, we can use different approaches for this. And uh, in my opinion, and I also studied some years ago in Ziggurat and uh, the experience I learned that it's very, very good to know different ways how to do the things. Uh, it allows to uh, students to learn a learning process so they can adapt to any situations. And that's uh, what we are promoting. And um, it uh, also ensures that they're ready for uh, real projects for construction industry. As I said, there's dif different kind of approaches uh, in the industry. It's very fragmented. And, uh, and my goal is to, to give the knowledge about all the uh, ways how to develop the processes, how to use them in real kind projects. So uh, yeah. That's, that's uh, incorporate the practical works, uh, also the lectures, this uh, theoretical knowledges, but um, we are mostly focusing on, on, on these uh, practical assessments, how, how to use all these uh, processes and technologies in combination with uh, other involved in the projects and the groups. Thank you very much. And now we are eager to hear how the Riga Technical University actually addresses the modern challenges of uh, distance learning. Carlos, please. Uh, morning, everybody. Thank you for the opportunity to talk. And um, I would say for Riga Technical University, basically we are university who are uh, mentioned to <laughs> in the beginning to study for 
face-to-face -face students. So it was quite a big challenge for us to switch in this short period to distance learning because it became very fast. And uh, most of our students is uh, after the secondary school or so they are not the professionals from industry, but they are young, uh, 18 from 22, 23 years um, young persons. And uh, this, um, I would say, change to distance learning was big challenge for us and, and the students and the teachers and professors. But uh, what can I say? The systems and the, the methods we changed, it uh, took a big effort for the all uh, teachers, but now the process are organized, I would say, very good. And uh, what the benefits I see for that, that it's a little bit pushed students to more to work more uh, independently and uh, find or uh, to work with the problems. So not only uh, expecting that the teachers are giving everything, but uh, really uh, they need to find answers themselves more. But um, yeah, so parallelly we really look what is going on in industry, what are expectations for that, and uh, the processes. I would say we are um, on the right way for a moment. Thanks. Thank you. I still think that we we all understand now that the distance learning is a common fact now and uh, this issue shall be addressed somehow. But uh, for regular people out there, sometimes there is a question, so they want to easily understand what to choose, where to go, uh, whom to listen. And that is why our next question is, uh, what are the two or three benefits of distance teaching that you have identified? So maybe we shall proceed in the same order. Dr. Noah, please. Sorry, it just takes me a second to open the mic. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Igor. Um, well, I mean, distance learning has a lot of benefits. <laughs> I mean, it's not just two or three. I mean, I just concentrate on the ones which I see are maybe not available per se in face to face. Um, I, I think one of the most important is the ability to closely collaborate with experts globally. Um, without the distance learning, you cannot have the live debates, the live crits, the live reviews that you can have with people from all over the world at the same time, uh, you know, all in the same space like we are having right now. Uh, this is especially important. Uh, I mean, distance learning is never just about you putting the material online and the students going in and seeing it. It's that weekly interaction with the people having those critical analysis debates and all of this kind of thing. And without distance learning, that's not possible, uh, which is closely connected to actually the students or the participants themselves sharing experiences. As we know, there are different work uh, um, cultures, uh, different work ethics, uh, different work processes that are done in different countries all around the world. And just the students being able to share that, um, they benefit from the problems that they go through and how they resolve them and things like that through uh, shared research discussion forums that, for example, we ask the students to do on our courses. I mean, we have three courses running at, this, uh, at, the, uh, at the current time at Middlesex who deal with different aspects of BIM, for example. Uh, there are the undergraduates, there are the postgraduates practical, and there are the postgraduate at management level as well. So all of this is benefited um, in that sense. But of course, besides that, there is the myriad of technology tools that, that can be used. Like you, not only can you properly annotate together with teams, uh, with your team or with the students online, you can use murals, you can use artificial intelligent bots inside a 3D virtual environments. It's just endless. Uh, you can also use virtual reality immersion uh, as well. So there are just so many things that you can do online, which are not specifically something that you can do face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. Um, so yeah, these are just two or three of the things that um, I just wanted to highlight. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, I think the things you've mentioned also relate not to education, but also to the real practical application to the projects, to the teams collaborating together. So, Rodrigo, the same question to you. Uh, how Very would good. you address this thing? Yeah, I am. I really agree with what just Dr. Noah mentioned. Um, actually, the distant learn, learning have a lot of benefits, and I think that they have a lot of benefits for the professionals. It's a very good methodology, so the professionals actually they can balance these the working hours that they expend in their in their related jobs, and they can actually they have some benefits regarding and these hours that they have to spend in the training. Just to give you an example, if you take a master and you are doing in a distance learning, you have to take in consideration that you don't have to and go to the university. So this time that you are in the, in the in, uh, going to the university, you can actually invest in yourself. This is an, just one, one, one very basic um, benefit. But and another one that is very important is um, that the, actually what's, what happened now in the, with this COVID situation is that, that the, training, the training that happened in the companies and, and, the, and the enterprise has totally changed. So and now the the companies is really getting this these benefits of training their employees and using the distance learning, and I totally agree with Dr. Noah as well regarding the international networking. Here in in Zigurat, when a professional come to study a master in being management, actually they come here to gain knowledge, to gain skills, but they really get totally surprised about the international networking that they experience in the master and how actually they, they, they learn as well from another cultures and another best practice from the other participants. So, um, yeah, basically I will mention these, these two benefits related to the distance learning. Thanks, great. And as it was mentioned before, the, both approaches of Middlesex and Ziggurat uh, are focusing on the already established professionals. So let's hear maybe another point of view from Artus and uh, Carlis, uh, because uh, in their programs they are working with undergraduates more, I suppose. So Artus, please. Well, if I have to mention two, three benefits, I would uh, at the first mention uh, uh, the flexibility this approach gives uh, because in uh, also in my uh, BIM courses uh, the, the students mostly are working uh, full-time jobs so they can uh, be flexible on, on attending the lectures the, the this um, uh, team meetings and at the same time they can attend their work uh, so uh, it's a great benefit for students to to uh, combine working and uh, studying process and uh, as a lecturer, I, I see also some benefits, and one of them are uh, the possibility to choose different kind of uh, uh, methods to to teach my students, uh, because some some of the students like to collaborate, you know, online one to one, ask some questions, or some prefer to read uh, lots of materials uh, by themselves, or or some others are just listening or or seeing the things. So. Uh, this digitalization gives me much more possibilities to to offer different kind of um, these teaching methods, and and each of student can use what what is best for them. And um, as the third, I would uh, mention the this um, uh, process, digital process uh, simulates the real construction work. So. Uh, I'm also working in a, in in a company for structural designing. So. Basically, that what I'm teaching is quite similar to actual uh, design projects, and uh, it's it's very good because the students get uh, the real knowledge that can be used at the same time, at the same day, uh, and their projects. So these are the three main uh, benefits I see at this point. Thank you. As I see it, the most important thing is that you are uh, having. Uh, or obtaining the uh, wide variety of different tools and approaches that you can apply in case you are working at a distance. So, Carlis, yeah. uh, please share your thoughts. Yes, thank you. What can I add to all other participants? Uh, 
one thing is that it's clear that the guest lectures or uh, it's a much more better collaboration with industry experts so you can invite them to your lectures or uh, discussions and they're uh, easier acce accessible yeah so this is one benefit and uh, what else to be honest this is a better opportunity for students to plan their time somehow because face-to-face uh, -face, sometimes when you had consultations so there was a big row uh, of students near the doors and they waited uh, even for some hours to reach the professors uh, now it's organized through uh, distance uh, with some uh, zoom meetings and it's much more better planned and uh, so this is a uh, uh, we, are, we are not like wasting time in so, so just waiting for nothing yeah so it's and it's allows students to uh, use their time if they're more efficient and uh, they become i would say as individuals more independent and start to plan their work which i believe is crucial for industry is that you are planning your time not just waiting that somebody gives you anything yeah I think that is great that you mentioned this one particular thing of uh, having the easier access to the brains of the professors and teachers because this is uh, one thing I remember from uh, my times back at school. Um, our next question was, uh, what are the two or three most notable drawbacks? Because we are trying to be unbiased here. But uh, I think I would like to emphasize one thing in this question that maybe you could share your thoughts on for whom or for what kind of person maybe uh, the distance learning would not be that much beneficial. So, Dr. Noah, please. Thank you, Igor. Um, as you said, it depends on whom you're talking about. Like, for example, um, on what you're teaching. So when you're teaching something related to management, I haven't really <laughs> noticed any notable uh, drawbacks most processes can be um, um, taught, discussed, um, work done, projects done collaboratively without any problems. The problems start to arise when you have a practical aspect related, uh, like the colleagues were saying as well, uh, if, especially if you're teaching um, undergraduates or people who are in trades. So you don't get the the luxury of, of, um, of doing model making, physical model making, for example, using a, a specific um, uh, equipment in workshops at the university. So that is denied, of course, for example, for the students to do. Uh, another thing as well is the ability to socialize between the sessions. I mean, I'm, I'm sure what we've noticed right now is that people finish whatever they're doing uh, online, even if it's a debate or a discussion discussion and then bye-bye everybody, just click and close. There isn't this opportunity to stand afterwards and socialize with everybody, which, which increases the bond. Uh, but I mean, for me, these are the two main drawbacks. Usually in normal times, and I'm sure that you're going to ask about that later, we overcome that in other ways. But specifically drawbacks, these are the two main ones, in my opinion. So this is the same thing that applies to business in general, the inability to do the networking properly or in traditional way, maybe. So, Rodrigo, maybe your thoughts on that? Yeah, from, from my side, actually here at Zigurat, and every time that, that we have a, a professional that is interested in our mass, in, in some of our masters, we have, an, uh, we have first an advisory meeting, so to set the expectations about what would happen in the master. And actually, and in our masters, we have a, a methodology. The, the the type of delivery of the master is 100% online synchronous. So actually, the participants they have to keep the track of the development of the master. So actually, the drawbacks and for who I won't recommend this master is for an engineer that and have to work on the field and maybe he he cannot guarantee. Uh, internet connection for um, um, in, for a moment. So, for example, we have an engineers that some, just to give you an example. If an engineer is working in a, in an oil gas industry and he work to, he, he has to work on the on the field 
for two months. This is a master that, that actually and won't be from him, no, because he, he has to guarantee this connection to the internet. He cannot be disconnected like two months in, in the master because we have a, a collaborative methodology that they have, they have to interact with another professionals. So when this is one of the drawbacks and we try to address them before they, they happen. Um, another another drawbacks that could happen as well is the, the life drawbacks. You know? If some candidate have an accident, maybe they, and, and they cannot continue the learning, actually they can make the change of addition of the master. But mainly, and I, I won't recommend the master if a candidate cannot guarantee this connection to the internet for a, a, a long period of time, no? basically that. So they still should attend. They should still should attend and do the networking and uh, you know be in the meetings. Uh, this is not exactly. like uh, also the Dr. Noah mentioned that uh, you cannot just uh, you know expect to listen to the recorded webinars and uh, get the same level of experience and knowledge. So the same for uh, Arthur's. Uh, what were your problems? Uh, what do you see that uh, is challenging these times? Um. Yeah, the, the most uh, challenging thing I would say is this um, communication, this uh, interaction in life, uh, socialization, um, because, uh, yeah, you know, online it's more formal. And uh, I think students uh, missing uh, this backstage uh, talks about the topic or, or after lectures, discuss and uh, in one-to-one. -one. And uh, it uh, obviously will put some, uh, some, um, uh, uh, foot, uh, feet on, on, on afterwards when they are working and this interaction my, my opinion is very important and uh, and uh, sometimes in these talks uh, there are, there is lots of issue appearing uh, that you cannot uh, see or hear in, in uh, digitally uh, uh, showing this this lecture yes and uh, as Latvians are quite introvert persons uh, they actually quite often are using this opportunity to after lecture to come to me and uh, ask uh, some questions. And uh, the next time I bring them for others and then some other one says, yeah, I also had actually this one question. And this is the biggest thing I, I, I noticed that it's missing at this point. So maybe these are the introverts who are not going to get all the benefits from the distance learning programs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. So, Carlis, uh, maybe you could share your thoughts on the topic. Yes, so uh, somehow I agree with Arthur that this uh, small competition in between students when they meet and when they sit in one auditory, uh, it's really miss, uh, missing. Uh, so, they are, th those uh, distance learning is more formal. So, and the problem, maybe you, you ask, the, what is a person who maybe cannot learn? This is a with a person need higher motivation it's uh, and it's uh, for those young uh, students it's really i would say a uh, challenge to find this motivation uh, because the system in uh, middle school is much more different and uh, they they are like uh, all the time feed with the information and and they're not like uh, it's it's hard to find this motivation for students and only the best ones can do but we have like a a uh, huge amount of the students in uh, technical university. So this is a one uh, drawback. And uh, other is, uh, it's a practical drawback. It's all those um, uh, equipment and uh, I would say um, IT issues. So it's one is uh, equipment in the auditories or in a university. So it needs to be changed and it's quite expensive thing. And uh, the same for students, they need to have those laptops and uh, through those distant learning, they need to be much more powerful. And uh, there is sometimes this, um, uh, unfortunately, question with how can they afford it and how we organize it. So it's a really practical issue too. Hmm? So I guess any education really requires 
certain amount of motivation from the students and Absolutely, some yeah. sort of consistency as well as the hardware issue uh, is uh, on top sometimes. So uh, this is the next question and maybe let's start from the end from Carlis. And uh, what are the technical or technological difficulties regarding the infrastructure, the internet connections, the availability of technology to uh, the teachers and to the students? How did you deal with that? Uh, first of all, what we have faced is uh, if uh, you want to have um, those live lectures, so this is equipment, and then uh, in the beginning, not all auditories in or it's uh, you know some facilities are not renovated, so it was challenge to put it there to find and prepare everything. So really great thanks to all those IT guys who helped and. Uh, this is one of, but uh, what uh, we have faced that um, uh, question is how you work or uh, are you working uh, just reading lectures from the presentation and uh, then give this like presentation later to students or uh, you, you work more interactively. So you present something, you show and st students prepare before the lectures and uh, uh, to be honest, um, not all the professors are ready to work in distance learning, and this is a big problem, I would say. Yeah? So they cannot adapt to this process, and then students are saying, oh, the level of knowledge is dropping. Yeah? But uh, from... Uh, uh, other technology aspects, I would say, we have solved all issues. So we, we can uh, have the, all the, those tools, which is like a Teams or Zoom, and then uh, you can work even in those different rooms. Students are ready to work, and so I don't see other problems. Mm -hmm. Great to know. So you you will be needing a team that supports you, the IT team. Uh, so Arthur's, uh, what's the state of the technological infrastructure back at the University of Life Sciences and Technologies? I could mostly agree to Carlis. Uh, what Carlis was saying, um, yeah, that there's different kind of uh, professors and, and lecturers, and uh, some know these technologies better, some not so well, and. Uh, more or less, we got this uh, day studying environment uh, where it's, it's available uh, of all these uh, tools that's that's needed for information exchange, for grading, for live uh, streaming uh, and uh, lecture sharing and so on. So uh, more or less, uh, I would say the same. The, the thing I would uh, like to point out the most one that in my experience is well, we got very good uh, internet connection. Latvia still uh, uh, at this time everyone is using the, uh, the internet, and uh, uh, especially and uh, if if students are or their their uh, full time job or or me are at the office, it, it comes to situations that there is um, several meetings or actually there is all the time meetings online, and uh, this internet connection uh, speed is dropping. So. Actually, I see that there's lack of uh, uh, power of internet, so it's quite uh, often uses uh, uh, issues with with learning process that uh, there's some delays in audio, video, or something like that, and all the rest of things. I think uh, we can more or less affect and and uh, make some solution. We can buy the software, we can learn, teach, uh, we can put some new hardware and so on. But uh, there's things that we cannot affect and. Uh, that's that's I, I've, I've faced and I cannot affect the internet speed. So maybe sometimes it's need to be cancelled this, this this meeting to wait uh, for a better time and uh, rearrange and, and and so on. So uh, that's that's the technological technology uh, technological uh, aspect I see and at this point uh, the Thank main you. issue. So Rodrigo, how's the internet speed in Spain? Yeah, actually, the internet speed here is quite good. So this is not a, a difficult that our participant experience in the master. And actually, we, in our name is the technological, no? and our name is Zigurat Global Institute of Technology. So um, we try to and address this difficulty 
technologies before they happen. So, and every time that a candidate wants to enroll in the master, of course, what they say to them that they have to guarantee a good connection for the whole year of the master. And and the other one is related with the with the hardware. You know? So they, they they commonly ask, okay, what what is the, co the computer that I'm going to need? And then we address them. They say, well, look, we have to look, we use a lot of softwares in our program. So you have to look to the minimal requirements that the software has and guarantee a, a good hardware. So, and regarding the the use of the softwares, actually we we give them an educational license. So we give them and we we provide the solution for this difficulty in the technology. So we provide the licenses, we advise them how what is the hardware that they should use it and to guarantee the internet connection. So this is basically the the, the difficult the technological difficulties that we could find in in in, in our and uh, learning methodology, but we try to address them before they happen. Okay. So you are uh, trying and you're doing your best to help your students uh, to get on the course and proceed with the course, right? So Dr. Noah, it's your turn. Uh, did uh, the Brexit somehow impact the internet speeds at your end? And uh, do you see this is a problem? Um, yeah, like, I mean, like all of the colleagues said, the main issue with the technological aspects is the students' bandwidth. It's not the institute's bandwidth, which is usually very, very strong. Uh, but, I mean, across the years, I mean, we've been doing this for so many years now, we've come up with a few solutions in order to counteract for the problem with students and uh, with the bandwidth and with the problem with their technical uh, equipment as well. I mean, if their computer doesn't have the specs to run a, um, a, a heavy processing software, for example. So one of the things that we've started using in the last couple of years is a system that allows the, the students to log on to the machines at the university and uh, open up whatever applications they need to open through the university. So this means that they do not need a heavy um, um, specs for their machines or need that high of a bandwidth. It usually gets resolved a lot better by logging onto the um, machines at the university. And uh, it, it's easy because, I mean, they, they always have slots in different rooms that we have uh, provided for them. Uh, but I mean, there are many other asynchronous methods of communication that can be used in, in, in problems of bandwidth, like flipped classroom teaching, like using murals for, uh, for discussions which do not necessarily need audio video. Uh, of course, like everybody will probably be doing, recording the sessions for their review later. But we also have our own servers at the university that run the virtual media that we do the communication on, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Adobe Connect, whether it's Cultura. So we have our own internal servers to make sure that there, I mean, if something drops, there's something else that can be used as well with a high bandwidth speed. But of course, there are the other um, industry known um, uh, methods of collaboration like BIM 360, um, like, um, and, and, and other methods as well, um, and licenses. Of course, we try to give them as many licenses as possible through an educational license. So, I mean, these are all methods to try to alleviate for the problem of the bandwidth and the specs from their side. Like uh, there is a certain amount of agility and flexibility always that uh, different kinds of technologies are, uh, you know, uh, trying to address. And it really depends on the way uh, and the topics of your educational programs, uh, who you are addressing. Is it, are these the managers or the software users or the undergraduates, etc.? Uh, so now we are a bit short on time. We have five minutes left and I will be asking the last question and uh, maybe Dr. Noah, you will start. Uh, when the COVID ends, what are your planned changes for your teaching process? How it impacted uh, all this understanding? Uh, did you see some tendencies uh, during the last year uh, and uh, where are we heading? 
Um, again, it depends on the program that you're teaching. If a program was already running completely distance learning, we didn't really that much feel that much of a difference. Uh, but generically, um, it's always good to have a blended learning approach. So it's good to have at least a few times a year, at least, if possible, where you can actually have face-to-face -face interaction with the people. To uh, Usually it's very good at the very beginning of the, of the course to get this bond running between the people. And then you can uh, enforce it like two, three, four times within the year, if possible, uh, to get this, uh, not just social interaction, but sharing personal experiences interaction as well. So I guess the only thing that we will probably be doing um, mainly on our undergraduate course uh, is to have this blended mode where they can come to university, use the machinery in the workshops as well. That is probably the one thing that we will be adding, uh, hopefully after we come back. Thank you. As uh, Dr. Noah mentioned, undergraduate uh, programs, uh, maybe Carl, uh, you could address the issue and tell us about uh, your plan changes. Mm, yes, uh, I believe that the most programs will go back to as it was before COVID, so it will, it will be face to face. So we have, I would say, more than half of programs where we use laboratories or we need uh, to have some um, equipment in the facilities of university. Uh, so this, from that aspect, uh, I believe we will not uh, change uh, a lot, but uh, this option uh, to use this uh, external experts or uh, cooperation with industry, this will be more used and the consultations with the professors. So I believe it will stay somehow f f as distance because it's much more efficient. So. No, is it the same for you, Arthurs? Um, yeah, pretty pretty much the same. Uh, I think uh, most of the, the courses will return to the usual workflows and uh, that uh, what will come uh, from from pandemic, I think, uh, from distant learning will be this uh, possibility to to uh, attend the lectures online, uh, to review them, to record. Uh, of course, uh, uh, sending uh, this this all these um, documents for course for practical works and so on that students prepare online, and then uh, so I, I think all this part will stay in collaboration with face-to-face -face meetings and lectures. Thank you. And Rodrigo, it's your turn. Surprise us. Yeah, yeah for, for our side, and actually um, change is a constant in our institute because we are very connected with the industry and the industry and the market is changing every time. So um, we, if you want to deliver the best practices for our participants, we have to change some things. Something that we are not going to change is our and uh, our methodology, how we teach for our participants. We have a, a process of uh, improving the quality of our delivery. So we have been doing this for 20 years. So the, if there is something that the COVID situation teach for us, was that um, the learning methodology is something that is here to stay and the companies actually are moving to this um, to this methodology. So we are going to change some, some things related with the market and the new skills that the market needs. But regarding our methodology and our quality, this is something that we don't negotiate and we are not going to change. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to now thank you all our panelists. It was great uh, seeing you today. Personally, I would like to say that uh, I would uh, prefer to meet you uh, here uh, in our studio in person, but hopefully uh, at some point of time we will do that. So thank you again.